you see the kids should, should go. Get the little thing up there. So happy Mother's Day. I want to say that because I'm just grateful for moms. I'm grateful for my mom. I'm grateful for my wife, the mother of my children. I think uh, it's appropriate to talk for a minute about how indispensable mothers are by giving a brief look into what can happen when they're not around, uh, specifically me. But I want to start with what I feel like is a public service announcement, okay? When a father is taking care of his children and mom's not there, it's not called babysitting, okay? <laughs> Fathers do not babysit their children. They parent their children, okay? So I just feel like that needs to be said, all right? So the first time that I cared for our son by myself overnight, Jameson was like over two years old. And it's not for any particular reason, it's just kind of how it happened. But there was a women's retreat. And so she's not just gonna be gone for one night, she's gonna be gone for two nights. And because of how far they're driving away, like she's gonna leave at two in the afternoon on Friday, she might get back at two in the afternoon on Sunday. I'm just gonna be honest. I was scared. <laughs> like, not because I thought like I wouldn't be able to present my son alive, you know, at the end of that weekend. But like, what am I gonna do with all that time? What are we gonna do? I can read him a story, like it's nine o'clock, and he wants to read a story, and it's the same book we've read 4,000 times, but okay, I'll do it again. But then it's 9.07, <laughs> and what do we do then? So I tried my best to make a plan of like, this is what we're gonna do on Friday night, and this is what we're gonna do on Saturday, and you know, Sunday there's church, so at least several of those hours are, are taken up. And here's what I'm gonna feed him and, and all that kind of stuff. I did wanna make sure that he was hydrated. Like we're not going to mess around with anything like that, which meant you know, changing a, a good bit of, of diapers. Well, Friday night, I was doing that, and the lining ripped, like the lining of the diaper, okay? What came out were these, these gel-like little glob things. It looked like clear quinoa or, or couscous, and I freaked out because I am prone to freaking out, first of all. But secondly, like, I don't know what this is. And I don't know how dangerous it is. And sure, there's, there's just danger everywhere, and God has a sense of humor, and so of course I'm dealing with this when I'm completely by myself. So I thought, okay, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? I have a brother-in-law. He has a PhD in chemical engineering. I will email him. Here's what happened. Like, I've gone to the Wikipedia page, okay? All I'm seeing are numbers and hexagons and lines connecting the hexagons, and I don't understand what any of that means. And he says, okay, here's what it is. And he sends me this, like, materials report. And, but he explained it. It's like, whatever you do, just don't put it down the drain because that's going to create this glob of like stuff that's just going to keep expanding the more water gets into there and it's never going to have your pipes again so it's okay with that but I need to know like can I vacuum this stuff because I can barely see it what if he eats it it's just the what ifs right and so he explains everything to me he says okay here's how to deal with it and then everything's gonna be okay. And I at least understand that mom's gonna come home on Sunday and I'll be able to say, hey, we, we survived. Yes, there was this moment of panic, but we survived, okay? 
We read things all the time. And they're not like chemical material reports. But how often do we understand? Okay. Likewise, we hear things all the time, but how often do we listen? Moms, how many times have you said to your kids something, anything of importance, knowing that you've got to follow up with? Did you hear me? Knowing that there's going to be a period of silence where then you're going to have to say their name, at which point they say, what? <laughs> Did you hear me? No. Then you got to say it again. And we just accept that that's the cycle. Like that's what has to happen. We can be working even hard to get the message if we're the ones listening, okay? But sometimes people aren't always clear, right? Like, Jesus knew that, and I think he was a pretty good teacher. And he would even say, he said more than once, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And we know that he was talking far more about, you know, the passive reception of sound. He's talking about hearing and listening and paying attention and understanding. And I know that's what we want of our kids, and I know that's what we want of us. In Hebrews chapter 5, the author is continuing his discussion of why Jesus is a superior high priest. And I think, like, well, what does this really have to do with moms? I think that what God is, is trying to get across to us today, okay, is the importance of listening. Listening to understand. And yeah, I know, like, we so much want that for our kids. But let's also want that for ourselves, so that it's not just something we expect of other people, but that we realize this is just as important for us. He is getting at, okay, here's the human high priest, and Jesus is a better high priest. He has the preferable path, okay? He's going to challenge his readers, his listeners. That's also a challenge for us. anything in the Bible, okay? We are dealing with two audiences. There is the initial audience, the original audience, the people who would have considered themselves the Hebrews to which this author is writing. But there's also the universal audience. And that includes us. Because God knew and knows that this was going to be read by more than just these people that this is his eternal word, that it would be heard and hopefully processed and applied by everyone throughout history until Jesus comes back. We're going to look at the whole chapter, okay, which can seem like a lot, but it's really just not that arduous. Um, it, it goes pretty quick, so you'll, you'll, you'll see that. I'm going to start reading here in, in verse 1. It says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. This is just a basic description of what the job of the high priest is in the time of the old covenant, okay? He's taken from among men. He's appointed on behalf of people. It starts with Aaron. It's passed down to his kids, to his sons. But by the time of Jesus and after up until the whole, you know, destruction of the temple in AD 70, it's as much about politics as it is lineage, even though it's not supposed to be a, a political job. It's focused, like the reason for the high priest is to offer, on behalf of people, gifts and sacrifices, things pertaining to God. Okay, he's referencing like the burnt offerings and the sin offerings 
the regular daily offerings, but also like the really critical feast days, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Weeks, Passover, things like that. Verse 2, I think, is interesting when compared with what he just said about the high priest at the end of chapter 4. Okay, So verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. In chapter 4, he said, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. So that's a critique of the human high priest. He doesn't live like we live. It's like if you look at your own existence compared to the president of the United States. He doesn't cook his own food. Okay? He doesn't drive himself anywhere. So how could someone like that relate to the things we deal with? Same thing with the high priest and everyday humanity. Here, though, in, in chapter 5, he's talking more about how he's a human being. Like, just like the rest of us, he is also human. He was born. He's going to die. He does have to do all the things that we have to do. And as long as he understands that, as long as he gets that he's human too, then hopefully he can deal gently with the ignorant and the misguided. Since, hopefully he gets that, okay, verse 3, because of it, he's obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. Like he understands that he sins too. He's weak as well. It's not just them. It's not just that you guys need this. He understands that he needs it too. Like if he really gets it, he's probably thinking the same thing that pastors think all the time. Like, who am I to be doing this? If people only knew the things that I struggle with. It's just, it's standard, run-of-the-mill imposter syndrome. You feel like a fraud, you feel like a phony, but thank the Lord for verse 4. No one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he's called by God, even as Aaron was. It's not something you can apply for. There wasn't like a job posting that said, okay, we need a new high priest. Please submit applications. It had to do with lineage. It wasn't a choice, even though there was one person who would say, okay, yes, you're going to be the high priest. They viewed it as this person is called by God. That's the human high priest. But look at Jesus, okay? So also Christ did not glorify himself. This is verse 5. So as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he also says in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That first psalm, or that first quote at the end of verse 5, that is Psalm 2. That is a coronation psalm. So here's the psalm that they would sing when David was made king, but also when other kings of Israel ascended to the throne. So why say that? Why say that? when we're talking about how Jesus is a better high priest, like why are we getting into coronation? We're talking about in this passage what it means to develop a good ear, okay? How do we learn how to listen? Not so just that we hear, but also that we understand, that we take something away from it that we are able to process what we are hearing, and that ultimately we would be changed. Well, what he's getting into 
is that Jesus is a completely different kind of person. Like, yes, he has some things in common with human high priests. You can see it in verse 7. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. It's like a reference to Gethsemane. But he's doing the same thing that human high priests are doing. He's offering up prayers to God, but there is something different about him. He's not just a priest. He's God's son. And maybe he's even a king. But then you've got this reference, okay, to this person named Melchizedek. And this is a quote from Psalm 110. Melchizedek's a really interesting guy because there's the references to him here in Hebrews. There's the reference in Psalm 110 from which the author is quoting. But then there's really the only moment that he shows up in human history. And that's in Genesis 14. This is Genesis 14, 17 through 20. This is where we see this guy named Melchizedek. What this passage talks about, okay, is how in Genesis 14 there's a war. And there's a war between these kings. This group of kings goes to battle against this group of kings. And in the course of all that, Abraham's nephew Lot gets caught up and taken hostage along with families and, and stuff like goods and, and animals and all the things that are important, all the things that would constitute wealth. So Abraham hears about that, he finds out that it's happened, and he organizes his own little army to go and get Lot and the families and his stuff back. And so he does that, okay? And that's where it says, like, the king of, of Sodom comes to meet him. It's after he's gotten everything back, okay? But then this dude shows up named Melchizedek. And he brings to Abraham bread and wine. That's interesting. And to know Hebrew, okay, is to look at his name and realize, huh, Melchizedek, Melech Zedek, king of righteousness. And he's king of Salem, which in Hebrew is Shalem. Shalom, shalom, peace. So his name means king of righteousness. He's the king over a land called peace. And he's bringing Abraham, the patriarch, the father of the Jewish people, bread and wine. That leads a lot of folks to think, I mean, I really don't know if he's human. I really don't know if he is maybe an appearance of God in the flesh in the Old Testament, a theophany, a God appearance, or a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. It is entirely possible as well, though, that he's just a dude, okay? That he really is a human king. Salem is the precursor of Jerusalem, okay? So maybe he really is a human king whose name happens to be king of righteousness and he brings out bread and wine. If that's the case, okay, then his whole existence, and this isn't weird, I just think it's, it's actually kind of cool, his whole existence, okay, is a teaching point for right now <laughs> or for when Hebrews is written. Imagine that the things that you're going through right now, God's going to use that to instruct somebody else 2,000 years from now, we still won't have flying cars, okay? But who knows where we're going to be, and wow, that God would use your life to make some sort of impact countless generations later. That's Melchizedek. 
This guy shows up so that the author of Hebrews can make a point. That Jesus does not belong to the order of priests that characterizes everybody else. Because everybody else is a descendant of Levi. He's not Levitical. He's something else. He's not just a human being. He's a son of God. He's a king. There is something different. But what does this mean for us? Okay, so if we're talking about developing a good ear, I think what it teaches us is that we should be listening to the one who's speaking truth. We should be listening to the one who is speaking truth. What I mean is we can be hearing the voices of all kinds of people out there. There are countless voices, myriad, plethora, endless, okay? It used to be that if you had something to say and you wanted other people to hear it, you had to like get a job in radio or TV, or you had to be able to write something that someone would deem good enough to publish. Now, all you gotta do is record it to your phone and upload it anywhere. And then anyone can listen to it at any time. So we have exponentially multiplied the number of people speaking and the number of people that we could be listening to. Just like the audience of Hebrews, okay? Like they were being tempted to stop listening to Jesus. To return to listening to that old way of life. The Jewish high priest. The sacrificial system. All those laws in terms of food and clothing. And we should really make sure that we don't have any mold in our walls because that would leave us unclean. To whom are we listening? To whom are we listening? I hope it is the word of God. I hope it's not people with really great hair and winsome smiles. Because that doesn't do anything. Okay? That doesn't benefit us at all. Just because someone says that they are spiritual doesn't mean that they're worth listening to. This spring, I've had the wonderful opportunity of driving all over the state of New Hampshire for school sports. And we drive through all these little towns. And it's amazing how many businesses I've seen where the sign says, psychic. Like enough that it stood out. Like you're going to walk in, you're going to sit at a table, and there's going to be somebody there, and I'm going to tell you exactly where you're going to go. Or you just open up any kind of social media and you have someone saying, do you realize that Venus is in retrograde? Do you realize that if you're a Leo or a Scorpio, that matters? I'm literally just pulling this stuff off the top of my head because I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> but it's incredible how seriously people take it. Or we take God, we pull him out, we say the same thing, but we use the word universe. The universe is talking to you. The universe is sending you a message. The universe has something to say. Or nature is sending a message. Or isn't it amazing how great nature is? We're just replacing God with something else because the universe and nature doesn't expect anything from us. The universe will never ask me how to, or, or tell me how to live my life. To whom are we listening? If you want to develop a good ear, if you want to be able to hear and understand and process and grow and change, it's going to mean listening to the right people, specifically the right person. The author gives us Jesus. So also Christ did not glorify himself as to become a high priest. 
But he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. I just realized right now, this is real time. My glasses aren't up here. Everything I was reading before was chapter four. This is chapter five. We're in chapter five. Just as he also says in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The author gives us Jesus. Don't be freaked out by words like having been made perfect. Jesus was always perfect. The author is just talking about how his life was lived out in real time. So he wasn't born speaking complete sentences. He didn't come out of the womb and, and start like just having conversations with everyone. Jesus grew up like everyone else did. So we saw his perfection develop. I'm not necessarily concerned that we're looking for a high priest somewhere. But I do know that there are plenty of people who want to be spiritual, who want to offer advice of spirituality, and it really does matter the one to whom we listen. As he gets into chapter or verse 11, okay, he's going to get more pointed in his criticism. He's going to actually get pretty blunt, all right? Concerning him, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. And the New American Standard, of which I'm reading from, okay, does not capitalize him in verse 11. But it's a relative pronoun. Okay? So what he's saying is concerning this. So concerning this idea of Jesus being a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, Concerning this whole topic that we're talking about right now, I want to be able to say more, but I really can't because you're not making it easy. You've become poor listeners, like literally sluggish in the hearing. Do you know how you feel like if you take a really good nap, I mean like a real nap, okay, where you're starting to slip into a coma around two o'clock. And it's this feeling you never actually have at 10 p.m. or 11 o'clock. Like you go to bed at 11 and you're sitting there staring at the wall and you're like, where was that feeling that I had at three where I could barely keep my eyes open? But if you really do nap and then you wake up, you, you shouldn't sign any papers in that moment because you're not totally conscious yet. You're not totally aware of what's happening around you or anything that anyone is saying. It's th that same kind of sluggishness, like someone's talking, but you're underwater. And so what you hear sounds like the teacher in Peanuts. <laughs> this is how you are hearing now. You've become dull. Verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Like how long have you been exposed to the truth? You really ought to be teachers by now. Not that he expects everybody to be a teacher. Not that the goal is for everyone to get to a certain point where like they can lead a Bible study or teach a Sunday school class or even take, you know, turns up here. It's just you really ought to know better by now. Like he's actually going to call them infants in verse 13. For everyone who partakes of only milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. He's getting into this human development analogy. Like, what is the difference between milk and solid food? Milk 
has already been digested. So you're getting pre-digested food as opposed to solid food, which hasn't yet. And so there's a need to digest it yourself. And we know that when it comes to babies, that is absolutely appropriate. They need pre-digested food because their bodies have not developed yet to the point where they can take it. My favorite, well, I mean, not my favorite, it's hard to quantify these things, but one of my really, really favorite memories of when my children were little is when my oldest was maybe like six, seven months old. And I'm home with him because my wife's at work and I change his diaper and I see something that just doesn't look right. And I realize it's a black bean. It's an entire, untouched, black bean. So I call my wife at work, say, hey, I found something in his diaper. Where do you think that came from? The other day, the previous day, she was eating a burrito from Chipotle and feeding him at the same time. And so the bean drops in to his mouth and just goes all the way through because his body wasn't able to digest it yet. He's saying, this is what you are like. Undisciplined ears lead to undeveloped stomachs. Undisciplined ears lead to undeveloped stomachs. We're talking about developing a good ear. Like we need to be listening to the one who is speaking truth but just because someone's saying something doesn't mean they're worth listening to, but Jesus is. And at the same time, it's not enough to just listen. Okay, we need to listen with the intent to understand, to process what we're hearing. Like, why does it matter what we're reading? What difference does it make? Yes, there's knowledge, but there's also application. The world around us and all the voices that we hear out there drive us to not want to listen, to not want to pay attention. Trials, okay, have a way of making us not want to pay attention, especially when you don't get what you're asking for. It becomes a choice, okay, a choice to focus. Again, not because we're trying to be a teacher, not because we're trying to create a church of PhDs, we just want to be able to digest for ourselves the truth as opposed to needing someone to digest it for us. Like maybe there's a better option. This is how he closes the chapter. Solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern, to discern good from evil. That word mature, it also means finished. Like, not that we ever truly reach such a place this side of heaven, but there is this sense of, okay, I understand good from evil because my senses have been trained. The word for trained is almost literally where we get our word gymnasium from. But it's not a place to just go play basketball. Like, that's not the idea. In Germany, high school is called gymnasium. You go from gymnasium to university. It's a place of development, human development, mental development. And that's what he's saying. You are ready for solid food. You will be considered mature because this, your senses have been trained because of practice to discern good and evil. What I'm hoping for this church, okay, is that we would be a people marked by spiritual maturity and also that as a place, this is a spot where maturity can be incubated because we are not born immediately mature. We don't come out that way, just like kids don't come out that way. 
yes, there is an appropriate time for milk, okay? Where truth needs to be rationed. Like if we keep going down this, this metaphor of, of human development, we know, okay, that you introduce stuff over time. Solid food doesn't just get dropped on a baby. Like you don't just say, okay, you're done with milk. Now it's time for steak and potatoes. Good luck. And the little kid just grabs the whole steak and starts gnawing on it. We know that it doesn't work like that. We know that trained senses lead to developed souls. Okay, like that is what we are shooting for. But how does that happen? I think you give yourself appropriate exposure. Give yourself appropriate exposure. When I was working with high school kids and someone would meet Jesus, I wouldn't say, okay, you've just become a Christian. Here's their, your read through a Bible in a year plan. No. Like, here's a Bible, okay? I want you to look at the Gospel of Mark. Or I want you to look at the Gospel of John. And I want you to look and see how every single one of these paragraphs has a heading. Just read the part that's the heading. That's it. And then do the same thing again tomorrow. That's giving someone appropriate exposure. It's introducing solid food a little bit at a time, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And I'm not suggesting that necessarily all of us have to do the same thing. What I'm saying is you know where you are. You know what you feel like you can handle. God's fine with wherever we are. He just doesn't want us to stay there. When we were at the retreat, we were talking about getting like a journal or a notebook or even a wide margin Bible where you can write down whatever it is that you read. Whatever thoughts came to your mind as you were reading something. Like, I learned this when I was 16. And I still think it's incredibly helpful, okay? Like you're in your Bible. So you look and say, okay, is there something here that I've learned about God? Is there something here that I've learned about myself? Is there something promised? Is there something commanded? Like even if all you do is bring these four questions to whatever it is you read from Scripture, you will be giving yourself an appropriate level of exposure. You will be training your ears to hear, training them to listen, training your senses that then lead to developed souls so that we don't end up as people who have untrained ears and undeveloped stomachs. Where we hear the word of the Lord and we say yes. And just as importantly, when we hear something that's crazy, a warning bell goes off or a red flag starts to rain, to wait. One of the things that I'm, I guess, got from traveling internationally is how if you don't speak a language, you are oblivious to difference in accents. Like if you don't speak Spanish, if you are not a native speaker, you don't know that Colombian Spanish sounds different than Mexican Spanish. If you don't speak Russian, you don't know that there's a serious difference, a significant difference, between people from Moscow and people from St. Petersburg. Like it blows your mind. We know 
that people from the Midwest sound different than people who grew up in South Boston. We know that. And we know that someone who grew up in South Boston sounds different than someone who grew up in rural Alabama or rural South Carolina. We know this. It's common knowledge. Why don't you know it? But if you say those different accents, if you use those different accents to someone who does not speak English, they can't hear the difference. They do not know. The best Australian accent I've ever used in my life just got wasted on, on Russian kids <laughs> who had no clue what I was saying or the skill with which I was saying it. We want to develop good ears. Every mother in here wants their kids to not just hear what they say, but listen. And we want our kids more than anything to hear what the word of God says. And not just hear, but to listen. And I think the best thing that any of us can do, mom, dad, whatever, all right, is be good listeners ourselves. Where we develop good ears, where we don't just hear, but we listen and we process and we understand. And hopefully we can teach the same thing to our kids. We don't want to be people with untrained ears and undeveloped stomachs. We want to be people who have disciplined souls. So give yourself appropriate exposure. As you are spending time in the Word, think about these questions. Not because they're the only questions, but it's just a start. And not because God's going to like you more if you do. Because He loves you more than you will ever know. And He wants us to experience that relationship that we have with Him. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank You for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you are in control of everything. That you love us, you love our kids, you love our moms more than we ever could. That you want us to be people who hear what you have to say and put it into practice. That we would be that wise person who builds his house on good solid foundations. Lord, I, I pray that this would be us. That we are proactive in our relationship with you. Because you have done so much. Because you have brought us into a relationship with you. I pray that we would enjoy it and experience it and get everything out of what it means to be a follower of you. Thank you for how you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand.